exciting week. We've had um, our EIP workshop going on since Monday. And uh, our final panel is on the topic of voter participation um, and looking at, at the role of uh, individual voters, civil society, um, and a, a lot of the, the issues surrounding democratization and electoral integrity for individual voters. Um, and so it's, it's a pleasure to have, uh, I believe, four panelists today. Um, and we're gonna let each of them give a presentation, not more than 15 minutes. We're gonna try to aim for the sweet spot of about 12 minutes or so. Um, I will let you know in the chat when you're about a minute ready away from getting being done. And when we're at the, the cutoff mark, I will uh, let you know. Um, and so what we're gonna do is then just kick it off with Owen Lippert um, from Opposition International, a co-authored paper on electoral reform in Bangladesh, uh, lessons for the post um, S4D, Summit for Democracy, Agenda. Um, so Owen, if you'd like to share your screen, if you have one, um, or, or if you're not, uh, just take away your, your presentation. Thank you. I, I really am uh, in, in a very distinguished uh, group here and, and, and feel perhaps a little out of place as I am more on the practitioner end uh, on the, uh, the, the, the issues of electoral integrity as opposed to the, the scholarly. Uh, my report uh, I, will, I will deal with quickly, and then I would like to speak uh, in the second half as to what current events mean in Bangladesh vis-a-vis -vis the topic inclusion or participation. First of all, let me begin by saying Bangladesh is important. Uh, it's the eighth largest country of the world. If you take the bottom 80 countries of the world, double their population, there's still not as many people as in Bangladesh. And when it comes to allocations of resources, if we think that uh, the more people there to be within the democratic system, then, then clearly uh, Bangladesh deserves our attention. Now, just a brief uh, what happened in 2007, 2008, uh, Bangladesh I won't go through the whole thing. Uh, had a period of, uh, of, of, of military dictatorships up until 1991, when, when there was a, uh, not a, a reestablishment of democracy. It uh, uh, led ultimately between League by, led by Sheikh Hasina, who is the current prime minister, and Zia of the uh, BMP, uh, uh, who's currently the opposition. There is the, the dynamic to the two that that is actually fascinating, because if you look at game theory and absolute uh, uh, responses. Uh, the low trust environment, uh, Bangladesh is is uh, an example of that. Now, in 2007, 2008, uh, the BMP was in, in power, and there was, as usual, a lot of uh, street violence and or demonstrations. But what broke through the usual population was the issue of participation. More specifically, the voters list. The voters list, uh, due to uh, a survey, a mass survey of over 25,000 uh, uh, individuals, showed that there was an over-registration of, uh, uh, of a significant portion um, perhaps as high as 12 percent of the of, of the voting population, and this just led to accusations of fraud uh, against the BMP. Now, there the uh, excess in voter registration was due mostly to internal, though it was being uh, used uh, for purposes 
uh, nefarious. Uh, I remember one old man saying, you know, I, I don't vote because some young man gladly does it for me before I even start out in the morning. Um, so the military stepped in and seated after a little bit of uh, 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 hesitation to begin a major overhaul of the voters' list. It was significant and indeed gave identity to people through the voters' list that had never happened in Bangladesh before. This had the curious side product of being a tremendous uh, empowerment of female women in rural, uh, the female voters in rural areas who before could not get bank uh, accounts, had to have their uh, in law sign and everything. But with the voters uh, uh, list participation and the subsequent national ID, uh, things improved. Democracy returned. Now, what, what's the lesson here in 2008 is that electoral reform can happen, but it has to coincide with a political rationale, that electoral reform is a policy goal, which will remain a goal unless it, it intersects at the same time uh, with uh, a policy, with a political uh, goal, and uh, what what are the implications of that? Well, the implication is electoral reform that just as a long term general evolution of higher standards uh, of plan and or procedures. Uh, will will not advance uh, terribly rapidly. It's those moments of rupture where there's an intersection of the politics and the political uh, background that create a result. Now, and I'm looking. I have my uh, eye on the time here. So, where are we now in 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 Bangladesh? There is a stasis, as there tends to be a stasis, in terms of any kind of reform in Bangladesh, unless there's a, a, some crisis. And right now, what that is, there is a standoff between uh, the opposition and the government. The opposition is saying no election that they will participate in uh, unless there's a government, which is an interim government. Now, that's not going to happen. Uh, and so this settlement looks to be a crisis. Uh, and, and I'll get back to that in a minute, to be a crisis. Uh, to try and force the government's hand to improve uh, electoral uh, performance. Uh, the U.S. government has said that we will ban, uh, not not issue visas to people we see who have uh, rigged the election, and that was in the paper that I went. It's been tremendously effective. Uh, it, it, it has really changed behavior to the point that the government very much wants for an election to be held and kind of opposition elected. Now, for the opposition, uh, this is anticlimactic. They are better to have an election fail, to have evidence of uh, voter fraud, and the whole thing be kicked into a second election, which is the tradition in Bangladesh, because that will weaken the government. So the challenge is there an electoral reform in inclusion in some of the polls that could coincide with this equilibrium of non uh, cooperation, break the deadlock, improve the electoral system, even in a face saving way for a credible election to proceed. And 
now I, I wish I had the magic answer here, but I do think that with the engagement of high-level thinkers uh, in the international electoral community as to the kind of reforms that can address the, the tremendous mistrust of, uh, of both sides uh, as to the election, that that may work. Case in point, electronic voting machines. Uh, both sides agree not to use them. And this is curious, because you'd think uh, electronic voting machines may be a, a, a bridge, but it also means a threat to established ways of doing things. And it's in some ways better that the parties engage, even under their old terms, rather than uh, lead to a further deadlock. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll start to wrap up. I, I would say that uh, greater inclusion would help. Uh, there, there is no doubt that uh, the popularity of a democratic system and the, and the public's wish for an election is huge, and uh, it's up to people who know uh, interesting ways to engage electoral reform and democratic process to, to contribute. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for your for your comments, Owen. Um, <laughs> great. Yes, yeah, so we're going to move to our next presentation. We'll go through all of them and then have a Q&A after that. Um, so our next presenter is Narda Carenza, um, and she's going to be presenting on guaranteeing the rights of, oh, you, it just went full screen. I can't see your, your title anymore. There we go. Um, guaranteeing the, the voting rights of trans people in a highly exclusionary context, the case of Peru. Um, and so we look forward to uh, hearing about your research, Narda. Uh, thank you, Holly. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this experience. Mm -hmm. I am presenting from a practitioner point of view also as Owen. And I want to share the experience we have in Latin America uh, regarding the implementation of transgender voting rights protocols in uh, some countries. Uh, but I'm going to focus mostly in Peru. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of context. There are four countries uh, right now that have protocols to promote uh, transgender individuals' voting rights uh, from 2017 to 2021. 20, uh, uh, we have uh, this type of protocols in Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. Um, the electoral bodies of these countries approved of, the, of those protocols uh, in order to promote the participation of this vulnerable group. Um, uh, in all these experiences, we have a lot of uh, participation from LGTB organizations and uh, activists from the LGTB community too. Uh, regarding the context, in, in which these protocols emerge. Uh, we have to mention that in Latin America, uh, the exclusion, the marginalization of transgender individuals is very high uh, from a socioeconomic point of view. Uh, we have also a, a huge uh, indicators of violence against this community. Most of them uh, work as sex workers. We also have in these countries in particular uh, groups that are very conservative and that have power in the legislative sphere. Um, we have um, more re religious groups that also play an important role in politics here. And we also have uh, another, uh, another issue because in the electoral process, the army and police uh, play an important role. They are located in all the polling stations, for example, and they don't have a good relationship with transgender individuals in general. Uh, so we have the emergence of these protocols as policy tools, let's say, but we have a context that is uh, very much against 
uh, the participation of transgender individuals. So I find that it's very interesting to have in this type of context, um, you know, uh, the, the capacity to innovate regarding uh, the democratic rights and the voting rights specifically of this type of uh, social groups. So I'm going to focus more on Peru because it's the case I know the most. Uh, Peru lacks a comprehensive gender law and faces challenges in allowing individuals to change their identification documents uh, to match their identity. So we, we know that there are protocols like this in four countries, but Peru is, an, is a rare case because within this group, it's the country where there are less um, tools to promote these rights. Uh, gender rights, identity uh, rights of transgender individuals are worse in Peru from a normative point of view. Um, also, Peru is a country where voting is mandatory. Um, it has higher fines. Uh, if we compare this country to others that have mandatory voting as well, there are few exceptions to mandatory voting. So let's say most people are forced to vote, even if they belong to groups that uh, shouldn't be forced to vote. So transgender individuals have to vote in order not to pay an amount of money that is not small. Um, from 20 to 21 to 2023, um, in Peru happened something different as well, we have that the electoral bodies um, have experienced attacks and harassment from the political sphere, from the Congress mostly. And we have a very polarized political environment right now. So the electoral management bodies, leaders or chiefs are under attack, let's say. Actually, like two days ago, one of them was um, um, was harassed and had to, um, um, how can I say, uh, his life is threatened right now. So it's it's part of the context, it's part of the rare, the rarity of this case because you, you are under attack uh, from political groups that are usually more conservative. So this type of protocols won't help that harassment. And currently also Peruvian Congress is attempting to gain more control over electoral bodies as well. This is similar to the situation in Mexico. So um, I, I wish you could see the names of the protocols as, and the year of their publications in this table. Um, we have the protocol in Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru here. Um, we can compare here what I say about compulsory voting and about uh, if there is an administrative procedure to change the name, I see, uh, you know, comparing these two variables that Peru stands out because of compulsory voting and because the lacking of this administrative procedure. So um, in summary, the situation, the context in Peru is more problematic for transgender individuals, and it's also more problematic uh, from the position of the electoral management bodies. So that's why this innovation, let's say, stands out for me. So I question, I make a question, uh, my favorite question is how a successful inclusive voting practice like this is designed and implemented? Um, this is an IBP, an inclusive voting practice that deals with systematic and cultural and institutional problems that affect gender minorities. Um, it is also a type of inclusive voting practice that requires the participation of other institutions that are present at the polling stations, like the army, the police, the judiciary. So these protocols include uh, in their rules, let's say in their contents, specific um, actions that many organizations, many entities have to uh, oblige to. Um, and in Peru also, we have an interesting process of redesign. We have already like uh, three or four uh, versions 
of the same protocol that has been improved in each of the electoral processes that we have been implemented implementing since 2021. We have like already four electoral processes, including um, primaries. So we have uh, actualized the protocol in each of one of these processes. And we can also ask about what challenges face the implementation of this type of IBP, um, especially specifically at the local is uh, the polling stations, right? So I, I found out that the concept of the of inclusive voting practices is very useful <laughs> to study this type of experience. And I wanted to share uh, this concept more in case uh, you haven't heard because I think it's a very recent one. It's the policy but it involves policy instruments that are aimed at reducing inequality in the electoral process for citizens. So this concept encompasses what this type of protocol is. There are other concepts that are helpful also uh, in order to evaluate this experience, like the concept of successful policy and implementation from a bottom-up perspective, but I don't want to delve much on this. Um, this experience has been uh, researched by me since 2021, and I studied it as a, as a rare case. Um, I, have in, I have applied polls to uh, polling station coordinators, polling station uh, voting table coordinators, district coordinators from the electoral body from Peru, and also the voting table members here in order to uh, monitor mostly what is happening uh, regarding the implementation of the type, this type of protocols. Um, what is also useful in these cases uh, is doing interviews with the people that are transgender. Um, early in my research, I found out that uh, the best instrument, the best, the best tool to do this type of research was the interview and a qualitative approach in general to uh, map the journey of transgender people uh, during the electoral day. So uh, my findings or what we can learn about this experience is that these protocols are, uh, are very similar between each, each other. We can speak of a, a policy transfer process but we also can speak of something else. What I find is that the problems that transgender individuals face are very similar in the four countries. And these protocols have um, very similar tools and guidelines in order to improve the experience of transgender individuals. Um, it's also important to mention that one of the strategies that transgender individuals value the most are the posters and flyers regarding the protocol that has been um, implemented uh, since 2021. These symbolic uh, type of tools are very important uh, from the point of view of these individuals and are also, is something that we can also consider beside you know, the behavioral guidelines only. And we have also implemented complaint mechanisms and educational activities. So we have you know, a policy mix uh, in order to, um, to attain the main objective of this type of protocols. And we have found that um, the collaboration of the civil society, the LGTB civil society has been very important for it. I don't know if my time is up yet, Holly. Can you, you definitely have a, a couple more minutes. Yeah, you're welcome to keep going. Okay. So I, I just wanted to share this experience and I want to finish with some more ideas. Um, there is obviously resistance to the implementation of this protocol. In the surveys, I have found that uh, the electoral bureaucrats um, don't use the materials 
they have you know uh, flexibility discretionality and some of them don't use the materials about the protocol they don't they just uh, use it for other purposes and they avoid in general the complaint mechanisms um, complaint mechanisms are avoided by uh, the personnel that works at the polling station and also we have found that the mockery the offensive questions about identity the resistance to apply these behavioral guidelines is also present uh, especially from the type of personnel that are less experienced and in peru we have that most of them are volunteer are not volunteers but are selected randomly and they are obliged to go um, it's mandatory to to go and work at the polling station booths and we have found also that in the high ranking officials of the electoral bodies we have a strong uh, place for leadership and that is the reason mostly that this type of protocols are going forward. And new problems have arise. Um, we see in Peru that the situation of trans people um, who change their name and gender in their IDs are specific. You know, we find that there are, uh, let's say, different categories of transgender individuals uh, regarding their identity uh, and their ID status, let's say, and also that we have that transgender individuals do, don't play a role only as borders. They also play a role as boarding table members, as bureaucrats as well, and these other roles have not been um, studied enough. So we don't know what type of issues they face in these roles. And also we have found that perpetrators are not easily identified at the polling stations. So it's difficult to monitor that as well. And I just want to uh, fin finalize with a question. Is there a common transgender voting experience? Are we going towards a unique policy tool? Great. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nerda. Um, and right on time, it was, it was great. Um, so our next panelist is going to be Afrim Kranaski. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, and a co-authored paper on just decriminalization um, process and electoral integrity with the case of Albania. Um, so I'll, uh, yeah, I can see your screen. So you're welcome to get, get started. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I think it's very interesting for us to see the difference differences of standards of uh, problems in many countries and many continents. I bring experience from the Balkan. Uh, in Albania, uh, it's a Balkan country. We don't have, we have only 2.7 2 million uh, citizens who, who have a right to vote. But we have experience. And for this reason, I decided to be part of this conference. We had the experience in, in, uh, in the war in Yugoslavia, that we have some specific law about the candidate who have, who have been part of the crime or other activity. And uh, we have a specific law in Bosnia and in Kosovo and other countries. But I want to bring the experience of Albania. It's unique experience. It's about the decriminalization process. Decriminalization process is the, the concept of the to stop the possibility to prevent the possibility of the candidate to be part of political parties or to be in parliament or in government or in official post if they have some criminal records in the past. We decided to make this law for one reason. It was a gap between two biggest parties. It was very close. And uh, as a small country, we had some individual who decided who can have a majority of the, of the member of the parliament and who controls some local, local zones. And we fight from the reports of the media and from civil society and the other institution that these persons, mostly from them, have uh, criminal records in the past. They have, they have been very rich. They use these criminal networks to be rich and to influence the politic in Albania. For this reason, parliament decided to make this law. It's a similar, we see many similarities to Sabrina law. It's Italian law 
against uh, a mafia in Italia. But we see some difference to this experience, to this Western experience. The biggest difference is that we try to, to use this law in, for all posts and all positions. For example, for one, uh, we have a list of the, the all crimes and uh, the people who are involved in, the cri in these crimes, they are prevent for the life to have a post in the state of Albania. In Italy, it's another situation. And we try to find in our studies to find similarity and to find difference with other countries in Balkan and others, others uh, European zones to see how work this experience and how was the impact of this experience. You can see the, the list of the crimes. There are many and there are they are important, but I think they are not. We we look to all cases in Parliament. We lost ten percent of the member of Parliament with decriminalization law, but the mostly from them they are not murder or criminals or something. They are uh, persons who don't declare in public that they have been in prison in some other countries. They have been in under investigation in other countries. They have been uh, arrested from the police in other countries. So it's different name with uh, many problems, but not with the criminals activity, directly with criminals activity. We had only two cases and that they have a directly criminal activity. And we see the possibility to, if this law is, uh, it's 100% uh, it's in, 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 in the past with the constitutional court, of, uh, with the constitutional co constitution of Albania and the Venetian commission, who is the institution who is responsible for standard of the election and integrity of election in Europe. And we see all decision of European Court of Human Rights, and we have two occasions two occasion from Albania. And we find that political party decided in formal way to have a consensus not to send the question in constitutional court. Why? They have information that the law in, in this form can violate many articles of, of uh, our constitution, especially some article who don't uh, calculate the right of the candidate to be uh, integrated in the society after five or six years. Uh, this year, so we have with penal court, but with this decriminalization law, we decided to prevent, to prevent the possibility for them to have a career for the life. And other sides, we find the, some documents from Venetian Commission who say that, yes, it's a special situation, and for special situation, you need a special law. And for this reason, they accept the possibility to prevent the possibility for this candidate to be in political position. And we have other recommendations from ODIR or OSE recommendation and from international missions in Albania, especially from some organizations who are very active in Albania, including the International or NDI or RPR or CAS or other organization who accept this law and they say, yes, this is standard, it's a new standard, especially for Albania and other countries in Balkan who have similar problems. This, it was a very huge debate in public that we can create it, the new standard for integrity of election. We have a standard of election. We have a standard of integrity of election. And we see the impact of this law and impact of this, uh, we can say the criminals in politics. And we see that the, the most important impact it was in situation in political parties, in internal democracy of political parties. We find that all these candidates they are nominated from the leader. They are not elected from the basis of the party. So the people in the party don't want to have this candidate, don't support them. And if we use the election as a primary in political party, they don't have a possibility to be in the political. Second, we see that we have a debate about legitimation and start of relation. If we have member of parliament or mayor of the city who are, who are part of decriminalization, who lost the mandate, it's the election very legitimate and product very legitimate. We see the situation with the in, 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 in uh, uh, relation to trust of democratic institution before and after the criminalization law. And we see the, the Albanian public, they support this law, but they don't accept that uh, 
this law can use only for candidate for the member of the parliament or for official post and not for candidate in political parties from position in political parties. And we see the impact in political culture and in integration projects of Albania. We are in, in negotiation to be a member of EU in Europe. And we see the other impacts, for example, if we want to have a records of candidate, we must send the request to other cities, other states, and uh, the answer will depend from other states. And indirect, we are depend from other states. And some states maybe have interest not to have an uh, answer or to, be, to collaborate with a candidate if they are a very important person. And for this reason, we see last year, for example, we don't receive more the correct answer from many states. In first year, they have been uh, ready to send, they, they collaborate with us, but in last year, they don't have more interest to collaborate. And in last years, we have a new situation. After the decriminalization law, we see for first time that the uh, United States, the government of the United States decided to use the new criteria of integration of election to make a designation of some political, very important person in Albania, some leaders, political party, to put them in the blacklist, we say non grada, and to say they are, we have argument that they are involved in criminal, with a, a criminal activity or in corruption. With Albania law, we cannot prevent this, this candidate to have a post, but in public debate, the mostly uh, polls tell us that the people support this decision of United States more than decriminalization law. But uh, as, other sides, we can see that decision of United States is more political decision than the court decision. So it's very difficult for one independent country to accept something what is the, as a criteria, what is uh, the political decision. And uh, we have last year similar decision from British government. They have another list and maybe other countries, you know. And in this way, we can have many lists, many, many black lists and many non grata persons, but uh, the we last poll, for example, we, we make last year, this year in Albania, and we see the, the, the majority of Albania, they want to send in outside the politic or in the prison more uh, the leaders who are corrupt and not leaders or political or political person or member of parliament who have a criminal record in the past or who have a problem with the United States, British government and other governments. So this conflict between public opinion, what the people want and what we have from the other aspect of influence from outside and from aspect of decriminalization is a huge debate in Albania. Our conclusion of the study was that it was a very unique experience. It's an experimental case. To have another experimental case in Albania, EU and United States, they make experiment to make a vetting purchase in justice reform, justice sector. We lost more than 50% of the member of the justice sector, judges and prosecutor, with the three, three criteria about the relation to the criminals, about the assets, financial assets, and, and about professional career decisions. And uh, similar vetting we want to use in other countries if or in other countries if we have a success in Albania, but we are we have we have a four years experience and uh, the majority of experts think that the experiment, it was not very effective. And other sides, we want to use this vetting for politic, to have a vetting in politic, but it's maybe impossible to prevent with a decision all the candidates who are supposed to be corrupt to be part of the election or part of uh, important post in the public or in political parties. We have a very huge support from the, 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 the public, but in short time, in short term, in, in, uh, in the future, we see the answer of the, the majority of the people. They want to see more democratization of political parties, to see more political culture in political, political parties, to see more uh, action of civil society and media in Albania, an international actor to go with information to the voters to tell them about the record of candidate and to obligate the candidate to have information for public if they have negative negative records in the past and the the last one the last conclusion it was that every year 
in every country of Balkan and other countries, I think in origin, we see that the EU or United States or others actors, international actors who are important actors in Albania and other countries, they bring new criteria. And the question is how many criteria must fill the country to be part of uh, countries who have integrity of election and who have a standard of election? And uh, can we have a international standards for all countries who can be similar standards and to see the the progress of each country. We see yesterday the debate with me, between organization and we see many differences between many continents and other countries. And I think the experience for Balkan and Albania can tell us that we cannot import the models from outside. We must try to find a compromise between the historical culture, between the, the situation of the country, between tradition, between political system, election system, and international standards to have a packet of integrity of relation for Albanian and other countries in Balkan region. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, our final presentation uh, today is going to come from Carlo Louis, um, Civil Society uh, and Elections Building Trust in Increasing Electoral Integrity. Um, but just before you start, Carla, I just wanted to confirm that Miguel hadn't um, come. Okay, wonderful. All right, Carla, so I will start the timer now and you're welcome to take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, and foremost, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very honored to be the, the, the last presentation of the, of, the, of the seminar. So, oops, I stopped sharing my screen. Um, uh, I'm very honored to be the, the the last presentation. So it's been amazing presentation. So it's a, a great responsibility to be presenting this. Um, so just checking, you can see my screen, right? You know, okay. So um, my presentation, as you as you know, it's about civil society as main element. So I'm going to talk about the the elections in Brazil. Uh, and I'm going to talk about trust and civil society, namely about participation of civil society. And of course, when we talk about elections, this is often the case that is one of the mechanisms of democracy through which citizens can take part in the government. However, and despite, of course, the importance of voter turnout and the participation of voters in the electoral process, I would say that there's also room within the electoral process in itself to, add, to have other avenues for citizen uh, participation. And I think that the case of Brazil shows it very well in a very uh, important way. First of all, because we're all aware uh, of the context of the last elections in Brazil, uh, where democracy in itself could uh, have been uh, at stake, and that it was precisely democracy, and this is a, a bit of a spoiler of the case that I'm going to make, trying to make here, it was precisely democracy and participation at a, bro a broader level within the electoral process that ended up creating trust um, and increasing electoral integrity um, in Brazil. Uh, and so here to this point, I just have to make a small disclaimer. I was in Brazil with the Carter Center expert, electoral expert mission, expert mission, but these views are obviously my own and solely my own. So coming back to the 2022 Brazil election, so we are aware of the, the context. So it was the context of permanent tensions um, within the, the stakeholders there was an extreme polarization. And this polarization also affected institutions and public and private institutions. So at some point there was almost no neutrality possible in, in Brazil. So every institution was somehow close to, to, to one of the, the big main contestants of, of the elections of the main forces. Um, and this also spread to public institutions. So uh, even from public institutions, many of them, they chose to take sides. And there was also um, an erosion of democracy. And I think this, is, this could be another communication, how to have elections, we also need democracy and a democratic context is already something important to take to, to where to, to develop and to carry out an election because many of the public instances, um, they had already been captured by um, 
by the incumbents and and for instance the military and i'm going to talk more uh, about this the military were already playing a big role in the electoral administration and also seeking to play even a higher role um, in the electoral cycle there was also um, an erosion of democracy there was a um, of free speech online and of offline there was a lot of hate speech and this targeted more women and minorities, sexual um, minorities and, and other groups. And many people and many um, institutions did not feel free to share their views. So there was not a public debate that could be conducent to um, a true political discussion of um, the, the electoral campaign and the relevant topics. And of course, the, the institutions, some of them, they were not playing the role that they should have played um, in the electoral cycle. But here there was also something interesting that formed, that there was a uh, unusual, and of course this expression is my own, a pro-electoral integrity front. And this formed with many civil society institutions, for instance, the, the Bar Association, uh, with fact checkers, with NGOs, with media outlets, by institutions that um, they had nothing more in common than to want to preserve democracy and to have a free election uh, in the country. But then the, the, the diagnosis, if we can call it like this, was a bit of, a, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this, institutional misperformance because institutions were not playing the role that they should have. It, it seemed that the, the, the institutions, public and private, they were kind of out of place and playing, uh, performing a mandate that some of them didn't have. However, there was this pro-electoral pro integrity front that also backed the, um, the carry of the, the administration of the election as such. And this is where the role of the civil society and all these organizations, they joined to build trust um, in the in the election. So you have here the, the electoral cycle approach. So this had come a long way. So um, you're cl very close to the electoral campaign. There was already huge polarization. Uh, there was a, a great climate of, of mistrust in the in the electoral system. This is what was the, the context. So coming back and giving a bit more context about the electoral management body uh, model in Brazil. So Brazil has the independent uh, model of electoral administration. And like many South American countries, the elections, they are carried out and they are implemented by um, an electoral tribunal. Um, so this was very centralized. Um, there was the Superior Electoral Tribunal, which uh, acted at the national level to central level and regional uh, electoral tribunals who had the, the power to implement the election um, at the local level, at the state level. Um, however, these electoral courts, they would call themselves the members of the judiciary, but they also had um, the tasks of the electoral management bodies. They had the regulation, they had the implementation of the electoral process, they um, took care of the voting machines, they had dispute resolution powers, so they had a high concentration of powers, and not all these tasks were um, tasks that were typical from uh, the judiciary, some were really from electoral management. And of course, as the electoral tribunal, the superior electoral tribunal was the one in charge of the electronic votes and ranging from uh, developing the voting machines and uh, securing the voting machines, the source code and, and these elements, um, they ended up being the targets of uh, the political um, discourse. And of course, within the electoral process, there was also the electoral system, there were also institutions with specific powers, supervision powers, the public prosecution. Um, and this uh, was one big issue because this was largely um, not being present, the the, the the act of the public prosecution. prosecution. Um, the Bar Association, which is foreseen in the law as one of the oversight um, authorities within the electoral uh, process, and the political parties. And here, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this, uh, what happens that the political parties, by several different reasons, they were largely absent and they were not present and, uh, in, the, in the electoral uh, process. So, as I was mentioning, the electoral management, especially the Superior Electoral Tribunal, 
um, became the target of the political dispute. So there was a, a climate, um, a, there was a generation of a climate of mistrust on e-voting, a bit emulating what happened in the United States of America. And the Superior Electoral Tribunal found itself in the center of a political dispute, which I believe it's not the, the, the place where an electoral tribunal would like to, to position uh, themselves. There was also widespread of uh, fake news with allegation of frauds and mistrust with the, the electronic voting, the electronic voting machines. But these um, allegations of fraud, they had never been substantiated. So there were there was no evidence. And the thing is that in this climate of extreme polarization, oops, in this climate of, um, of extreme polarization, um, there was, and, and recalling the situation in Brazil, a high number of ministerial cabinets from the incumbent, they had the presence of the military. So there were ministers who were members of the military. And for instance, in this particular case, there was um, there was a combination of factors which made uh, the military being wanting to take um, a role as a supervision entity and one of the oversight entities of the of the electoral process process. And there was uh, even one um, military appointed by the Ministry of Defense spreading fake news and allegations of fraud regarding the electronic vote. So this really created a climate of um, of distrust. Political parties, as, as, as I was mentioning, they, they had an erosion of their role, especially the opposition parties. So the opposition parties, they lost the tradition, so to say, to be present within the electoral cycle because there was not a tradition of fraud, there was not a tradition of political parties being, being present. Um, and this gave um, empty, provided uh, an empty space. Um, and this empty space was trying was seized and there was here the presence of the, the military who, who had a strong connection to the incumbents and to the government who tried to fill um, these, uh, these roles. And of course, um, there was also in the, in the public institutions, there were, they also had a prominent role in the electoral uh, process and they were specially affiliated with the incumbent. And we see now the, how, the outcome of this just recently that the incumbent uh, former president Bolsonaro lost political rights uh, uh, precisely because of the use of um, of state resources and the the states um, and the, the the public capacity to interfere in the in the electoral campaign um so um regarding the electoral system there were many many aspects which um converged to this situation there was a, a high um a, a very high role for technology. So there was electronic vote, biometric voting, identification, counting and tabulation. And of course, all these, they are more difficult to scrutinize. So they gave room to allegations of fraud and, and fake news. And this was spread through social media, um, also with fake, fake, fake uh, news and hate speech. And so the, the electoral management, they, they, they became the, the targets. And there was also the dissemination of fake news and misinformation uh, by public authorities and by the incumbents and ministerial uh, cabinets. And so this phenomena was overwhelming. Uh, and, and of course, again, it was up to the electoral tribunal to deal with these fakes, uh, with the, the fake news, the, the overwhelming amount of fake news, while there had been created the perception that the electoral tribunal was also picking, uh, picking sides. But here, um, uh, the social media was also uh, widely used in this. They had a, a prominent uh, role. So there was, I, I mentioned this, there was this institutional misperformance. So we find that the, we see that the institutions were not filling the place that they should be. And some of them, they were leaving empty spaces to be filled. Uh, and so in the case of the military, they tried to become the oversight uh, entity of the electoral process. They had huge numbers de deployed at the polling stations. And even within the Senate, they tried to make um, suggestions for legal amendments. So they were making allegations of fraud and um, misperformance of the electric electronic voting uh, system. And they were even making suggestions regarding political parties. So it was really um, atypical um, to, um, to see this. Um, and, and so there was this uh, this mis, uh, misperformance. 
However, there was the creation of this so-called pro-electoral integrity front. Um, so, uh, and this was largely done by the Superior Electoral Tribunal in a move that proved to be um, very substantial and very meaningful. So what the tribunal did was to create networks and mechanisms at the national and international level to allow the participation within the electoral cycle. So first of all, electoral observation, and electoral observation is something relatively new to Brazil. So there were huge numbers of international electoral observation missions, and this was very unusual, um, And but also domestic electoral observation missions. And so we call Transparência Internacional Brasil, they deployed huge numbers of citizens of servers across the country, and they also had the protocol of cooperation with the electoral tribunal. Um, and so this was an attempt, there was also associations of public prosecutors, from students, universities, and this was a mechanism through which participation, civil participation was also, also ensured within the electoral process to an extent that had never been seen before. The Electoral Tribunal also created the Transparency Commission, where many entities were present and could take part and make suggestions to the, um, the carry out of the election and to the electoral management of the election itself. And the, the Tribunal not only published the decision making process, uh, as well um, uh, as the decisions that were taken and uh, the reasons for not taking this. Um, but they also ensured um, a broad participation from these entities. There were partnerships and cooperations with civil society uh, and network, uh, networks of cooperation and institutional communication. There were protocols with fact-checking agencies, with other public um, authorities, uh, and this created, um, and th with this I'm moving uh, to, the, to the end of my presentation, and this created, created an image of, of openness. And while there were allegations of fraud and mistrust within the electoral system, the response of the TSC, the Electoral Tribunal, was to open and to engage with civil society to show trust and to build trust in the electoral process. Um, so um, this is one of the main uh, one my main conclusions to show, and I think the case of Brazil shows that the, in a context of high polarization. Uh, the answer and the way to build trust was a very smart and meaningful move from the electoral tribunal to open up um, the electoral process to civil society and their institutions to, from this point, to create a trust in the election itself. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.